Last time I checked, Arsenal actually have to lose against Liverpool. Liverpool actually have to go to the Emirates and put the ball in the back of our net. So why are Arsenal fans all doom and gloom and pretending like we've lost already? Is there numerous reasons to be negative or have a negative cloud around our football club? Yes. Is there any reason to really be optimistic? Probably not. But they've still got to go out there and win. If we're going to pack up our season right now, we might as well go home. On that note, Welcome to everything Arsenal people. I'm going to condense all the Arsenal-related talking points and preview Arsenal-Liverpool with you guys. Let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to smash the like button and subscribe. Let's go. As Mikel Arteta himself said, injuries are no excuse. We're going to have to get on with it, folks. But I'm not going to sit here and lie to you lot. To have no Calafuri, no Tomiyasu and no William Saliba in one of the biggest games of the Premier League fixture calendar list against one of the most lethal attacks in the Premier League. It hurts people, but we have to get on with it. Now, there's a lot of big questions. Am I and a lot of you reading too much into Miles Lewis Skelly coming off the bench against Shakhtar Donetsk? I mean, Mikel Arteta could have just wanted to give him minutes, could have reckoned he's the best option, or it could have been a viewpoint as to whether he will start against Liverpool. Would you start him against Liverpool? Because you could argue there is no answer owing to the injuries. You look at Miles Lewis Skelly, do you play the young player, which he might, you know, stand up to? At least if Salah destroys him, it's a learning curve. Do you go with Kivio, who, you know, needs his hand held? Do you go with Zinchenko? I mean, let's be brutally honest, people. We've seen the Zinchenko story against Mohamed Salah in particular and Liverpool many a time. But as Mikel Arteta said and alluded to kind of where we're at, the team that starts might not necessarily be the team that finishes. So whether it's Lewis Skelly, whether it's Kivio, whether it's Zinchenko, they're going to have to play some sort of minutes, people. You look at Zinchenko, has he actually played that much football since the opening day of the season as well, which kind of concerns you people. Then you look at what Mikel Arteta will do at centre-back. If he moves any of his available fullbacks into centre-half, then arguably there's no, you know, there's no center, there's no fullbacks involved or, or available people. Does he go with Benjamin White? Does he go with Timber? Does he do a left field choice and it affects the midfield? Do you put Declan Rice as a centre half? You know, if Timber is fit, he probably does play left back. You probably do want him against Mohamed Salah. Does he play centre half? And again, do you look for the Kivios and Zinchenkos? Is it one where we're going to have to manage it game a minute by minute? Apologies as the game goes on, people. I'm not too sure, and I'm happy I'm not Mikel Arteta. I, um, to have to deal with this. I do want to ask you lot one thing. While injuries can happen and we have had a bit of bad luck with injuries, have we assembled this squad in the best possible way, people? Because we, you can see the knock-on effects with several players that are not involved, people. You know, on the injury front, we all know the injuries, people, the Califuris, the Timbers, etc., etc., Bakayo, Saka. As you can see on screen, Mikel Arteta presented a mixed bag when asked at his press conference. I think when you look at the Bournemouth game, I'm not reading anything into what Mikel Arteta says in his press conferences. And me, for me personally, I'm simply dealing with an hour before kickoff, whoever is in the squad in any capacity. That's what we're going with. We know we lose a lot without Martin Odegaard. You know, the statistics around creativity and defensive drop-off, it's all there, people. Of course, we've been getting some results without Martin Odegaard, but we are struggling to create consistently over 90 minutes looking at our midfield. You've seen many a midfielder, people. You've seen us go with with Moreno, Declan Rice and Partey, which did not work against Bournemouth. You've seen Kai Havertz drop into midfield. You've obviously seen, you know, Trossard play there. These are all short-term fixes and don't provide long-term solutions. Is it time for him to give young Ethan his first start? Do you believe he will throw Ethan in there? Or do you think it's one where we'll see Mikel Arteta tweak things tactically? Because it's going to be a fight against Liverpool and the one area that's getting a glowing reference from Liverpool under what Arnslot is doing, people, has to be their midfield. Do you get Gabriel Jesus into the team up front? Do you put Kai Havertz on the into midfield? I'm not too sure what he's going to do in that regard. On the topic of Saka and Odegaard, of course, simply put, we lose the ability to get out of jail. They're our two best creative players. They can make something happen out of nothing. So if Bakayo Saka isn't involved, and even if he does start, does he have 90 minutes? Do you go with Raheem Sterling against his former club in a game of this magnitude? Or do you go with Gabriel Jesus, whose, whose stocks are on the floor where Arsenal's concerned and while he didn't score against Shakhtar and had a great chance I definitely feel in a long time that was one of the more positive kind of contributions for him as I said goals and creativity win games we've got some results without Odegaard and to a degree Saka but without them we struggle and there's no way around it in in that regards folks 
I must admit, people, I'm a big fan of the height we've got in our team, our defensive and midfield tenacity and our overall improved outlook on what you typically need in the Premier League to be able to fight. Now, I'm not going to lie, people. I do believe it's come at a cost. I think where, you know, you can't compare Mikel Arteta and Arsene Wenger at all. But I personally feel we are two extremes. I think under Arsene Wenger, forgive me, granddad, but we were too attacking centric and we disregarded defending. I think under Mikel Arteta, we're very good defensively. Not of recent, but we're typically good defensively. I think it was interesting when Mikel Moreno came out and kind of indirectly referred to us as an NBA slash basketball team in which we've got six foot plus players. We all understand the reference. But last time I checked, typically football, I know we go along with David Raya, but football is played on the floor. And for Mikel Arteta, we have to be brave defensively and offensively. And no matter what we say, goals win games, people. Defence wins titles. We've got that. But goals win games. I need to see some creativity. I don't know how we fix that, whether we've got the tools available, whether we've assembled the squad in the best possible way. I don't know. But against Liverpool, you need to create chances. You need to be brave. Let's not kid ourselves. Liverpool are great defensively. The stats are there. They're flying, but they're not invincible. They haven't got their first choice goalkeeper in Alisson. They have a fantastic keeper in Kelly. And it's disrespectful to say he's a number two, if I'm really honest with you. But we're going to need to be at it. How does Mikel Arteta sort that? I think some of it is psychological. I don't know if we've got the personnel to consistently create. Maybe it's a case of set piece FC, we're back. Ultimately, folks, people, Sunday we go to battle. Ancelot men are the most informed team within the country. They're getting points with the with the exception of slipping up against Nottingham Forest. They're flying under their new manager. I won't be disrespectful to Liverpool or Ancelot or Klopp indirectly. And I won't go as far as to say this, but at this moment in time, it appears that they are not missing Jurgen Klopp. And I think it's going to be a different kind the game in a sense that a bit like similar to Arsenal people onslaught men at times they go a goal up and kind of sit back so it's going to be quite technical there is one thing I want to speak about as well people is set pieces now against Bournemouth we conceded um, from a set piece Liverpool are quite great at set pieces Mikel Arteta referred to that people make no mistake people they've made a dream start they're firmly in the title chase people they're a quality team with a quality manager with quality players who could potentially dent our title hopes or put a spanner in the works on Sunday it arguably is a six-pointer. You've also got to remember, people, they've not won here at the Emirates in the last four visits. This could it be a case of fifth time lucky. I'm sure on slot men, they will be preaching that form goes out of the window for both teams, but they are going to want to smell blood and harm a wounded animal. And you could ask the question, is this the best time to play Arsenal Football Club? As I said, we appear to be a wounded animal. Now, statistically, away from the hype and the media narrative, if we do lose to Liverpool, you know, you've still got a lot to play for. You're still firmly in the title race and all the other competitions. Likewise, if we turn it around against Liverpool after a shoddy game against Bournemouth and a lacklustre performance against Shakhtar, the narrative will change. If we win, we shouldn't get excited. But I'm not being funny. For me personally, I don't like the woe is me stuff from Arsenal fans. There's a hundred reasons to be negative or a bit pessimistic, but we've still got to make it difficult for Liverpool. Have some pride in the shirts and assume, assume, assume that the Emirates is going to be rocking because the, the, the players are going to need the fans. They're going to need the fans. And I know we say this all the time, people, but it is going to be an ugly game and one of the biggest games of the season. Mathematically, there's still a lot to play for. However, the narrative will be around Arsenal very ugly if we do lose to Liverpool, considering we've got Inter Milan next week, Chelsea to come, Newcastle to come, and just a bunch of fixtures from now until probably February, where we've got injuries and a depleted squad. I don't know what will happen, people. As I said, there's a hundred reasons to be a bit negative. There's reasons to be positive, probably a bit blindly positive. So it's a mixed bag. Now, as I said, this video is called Everything Arsenal, people. So, yeah, away from the Arsenal-Liverpool games, get the creative juices flowing. Hopefully, I've given you a lot, a lot to ponder. Make sure you smash the like button, you comment and subscribe. Forget all of that. I enjoy you lot's conversation. I want to hear what you would do regarding our centre-half options. Gabriel and who? What do you feel about right-back? What do you feel about left-back? Would you play Declan Rice centre-half? Do you play Kivio and Zinchenko? Does the young Lewis Skelly come into the team? What would you do in terms of the formation? What does it mean? 
mean if we win, lose or draw against Liverpool? What is the best result away from a victory, which is obvious, people? Let me know your thoughts. Now, if we focus a bit on transfer news, as we approach the January period and obviously next year, we all know 99% of these things are BS, but it entertains us. Arsenal have been linked with Lamine Yalmao, a player bearing in mind, you know, Laporte or Barcelona came out and said they rejected a bid of 200 odd million quid. I'm not comparing him to Messi. Definitely got a long way to go before he could even scratch the surface. If he even shows a 1% of what Messi's done, then it's great. We've been linked with him. Bearing in mind, Barcelona under Hansi Flick look good. Yalmao is the leader of the new school. You know, they've got Rafinha, who's older, but Yalmao is the jewel in the La Masia stuff. And you've got him, Pedri, Gavi, Casado, a bunch of young players coming to the fore now. He is going to be at Barcelona for a while. Nonetheless, though, he's been linked to Arsenal Football Club. I know we've got Bakayo Saka on the right. Me, I'm bring. if this was real, which it's not, Yalmal is more than welcome. For me, he's comfortable across the front four. I would actually play him as a 10, like a roaming kind of 10, really. And obviously, to have him and Saka competing on the right-hand side would be great. Barcelona are broke, as we know, much like me. Smash the like button, people. Um, you should never say that. Um, I'm joking. But um, yeah, naturally, they're struggling financially. Paper talk. We've been linked with Yalmao. For what it's worth, I think I should speak for every Arsenal fan. We'd love Yal Lamine Yalmao to sign for Arsenal. He's also been linked with Liverpool, who, you know, that's the long-term Salah replacement. It would be amazing, people. Arsenal continue to be linked with Jokeres, who continues to bag goals for fun. Now, I'm not going to sit here and act like I watch sporting religiously. The main thing that is why he's on everybody's lips is goals. That's all people care about. The man is scoring goals for club and country, doing it last season, picked up where he left off. Goals are one thing. But if being a goal scorer is everything, you might not have seen Havertz have the chance to play up front and thrive. We probably wouldn't have signed Gabriel Jesus. You wouldn't have seen Eddie and Ketia play. We all know in the modern day, goals are one thing. It's what you do in all the other facets. And I think when he drops into midfield, the way he works the channels, go and look at him in the Champions League last week, the way he works the channels, the way he drops deep, his link up play, all of that added to that and you sprinkle on goals. I think he's the perfect striker for a Mikel Arteta system. I don't know if the volume of goals will correlate to the Premier League and Arsenal have a chance creation issue, I believe, purely because if you look at some statistics and you look at Jokerez's touch in the opposition box, beyond him being great, you put, you know, your strikers in the box, he's scoring goals. We're not creating exactly any chances for Kai Havos. We're not playing to the standard where you could say we're creating a million chances. We're not putting the ball in the back of the net. You need a forward. So I think it's deeper than just signing a striker. It's one thing to buy a tool. It's another reason. It's, it's another to, to be able to utilise it, people. Uh, again, very predictable transfer news. Arsenal, Newcastle and Aston Villa allegedly are all keeping tabs on Ferran Torres, who could be allowed to leave for €25 million. Euros. Arsenal and Liverpool are keen on striking a deal for Arda Geller, who is still struggling for game time at Real Madrid. Could it be Mesut Ozil, Martin Odegaard-esque? Would love him at the club. Would you really want to leave Real Madrid? Right now, I don't know. But Shittas are keen on signing Dominic Calvert-Lewin with Newcastle, Arsenal and Manchester United also all interested in the Everton forward. Apparently, Arsenal have declared an interest in signing Alexander Izak. Sources believe Izak's camp will seek a move if Newcastle do not qualify for the Champions League next season. However, though, iSport have said Izak is keen to sign a new long-term deal beyond 2028 at Newcastle, despite interest from Arsenal and Chelsea. Arsenal are considering a move for Valahovic, having previously tried and failed to sign the man in 2022 i don't quite believe that people and we know his contract has 18 months to run football insider have also said there's a growing feeling the striker could be on the move he's got 18 months left on his deal he either has to sign a new deal at juventus or be moved on it's as simple as that allegedly former england coach jimmy floyd hasselbank has urged thomas tuchel to have a conversation with ben white about an england recall it'd be lovely arsenal and liverpool be linked with everyone in it arsenal and liverpool are both prepared to make significant offers to sign rodrigo who will be allowed to leave real madrid for the right offer. That's crazy, but fair enough. Um, where Arsenal were concerned, apparently there's been changes in the by Richard Garlic, who was promoted to managing director earlier. To managing director earlier to 2022 before he left to join the Professional Footballers Association PF Footballers Association PF to become their director of football operations and football operations and deals for the legal team when he first joined Arsenal in 2016 before moving into their football operations for moving into their football operations his women and academy teams from his previous time at the club so welcome back and he's a qualified lawyer 
um, for what it's worth, apparently. Um, and big up Richard Garlic for what it's worth. Moving on once again, Arsenal, Aston Villa and everyone are still being linked with Ferran Torres, people. And in case I didn't make clear, obviously, Mikel Arteta is still doing the mind games where our injured players are concerned. He said Ricardo Calafuri, Bakayo Saka and Timber are very, very uncertain to play against Liverpool. We are going to do our very best to somehow have them available, but it's very, very uncertain. Bearing in mind, he made out Saka was going to be there against Bournemouth and what happened. So... I think where I'm at in this current climate with Mikel Arteta, bearing in mind he's keeping his cards close to his chest, it's a thing now for the next few weeks. I'm just going to wait an hour before kickoff when the teams are announced and that's who we've got available, people. Um, on Calafuri, he needs some more tests. Yesterday he had some. Today he's going to have more. After that, we will know. Last time we thought it was really bad and he ended up playing two days later. On Bakayo Saka, he's done a bit of training on the grass. How far we can get him before the game is another question. We have another game, which is a good thing because this week, we had an extra day, we'll see. On Timber, who apparently hasn't been named in the Netherlands squad for the upcoming international break, the, the provisional squad of sorts, it's his first session that he, Timber, could have some involvement. We expect him to be further back in his rehab. Again, we'll have to see. Now, off topic, but if you missed it, go back to the beginning of the video, yeah? When you look at our available players, Mikel Arteta said the players, basically the players who start the game might not be those who finish the game, right? When you look at it, Zinchenko's been fit for a couple of weeks, but he hasn't really played since the Wolves game, forgive me if I'm wrong. Timber hasn't played until um, beyond pa Paris Saint-Germain. So you wonder about the overall health and fitness and the, the duration that these players are able to play people. So we'll have to see, man. Um, so yeah, big up Timber with that. We all know we're four points behind Liverpool. We could close that to one point if we win. We could drop as low as six. Now, on one hand, it is a disaster if we lose points. The sentiment, you know, after when you're Arsenal, you're one game away from a crisis, as we know. Obviously, the performance against Shakhtar wasn't inspiring, but we did win. We were terrible against Bournemouth, even with 11 players. And we were sloppy all over the field. If you lose to Liverpool, the pylon starts to begin, which I understand. And I think when the club's doing well, deserve praise. When it's doing shaky, I think there needs to be complete question marks. And when I look at it, the Liverpool game, mathematically, there's still a lot to play for. There's still a lot of points on the board. You can't get excited, but you're chasing a lot of points. It's one thing talking about Liverpool. It's another thing creating more of a points gap with Manchester City, who, forgive me if I'm wrong lost three games last season we all know, all know city will drop points but you you know the more points you drop the further it gets bearing in mind we don't know what the future has to hold we can mock man united we ain't got the best of records at old trafford we still got to go to anfield you know we still got a lot of tricky and testing games and again no no game is easy on paper we should have been walking away with the bournemouth game that should have been three points at half time but that's not how football works people so yeah as usual big up yourselves i thought you know in terms of getting better and creating more content for you i thought let me condense this into one video again people i want your comments on what we've spoken about with Bukayo Saka and the injured players. I want your tactical um, comments. I want how do you feel about the Liverpool game and whether we win, lose or draw. And obviously it's 90% of it is nonsense but if you've got any opinions to have on the transfer front, let me know. Most importantly big up yourselves for watching this. You're part of the family if you're tuned in. If you're new here you know what you need to do. On that note, stay safe, stay blessed. Peace.